morning to all of you. So we have been using insulin for nearly a century now and we know that kidney disease is a consequence of diabetes for a little less than a century. And those of us who are practicing, we often need to use insulin to manage glycemia in kidney disease. And we would not be wrong if we thought that there's a lot of evidence as how you can use insulin in kidney disease. But the truth is actually the reverse. It's not at all black and white, but there's a lot of gray areas, which I'll try to cover over the next 10, 15 minutes or so. And what complicates the issue even further is that insulin and carbohydrate metabolism go all wrong if you have kidney dysfunction. Because as you can see, a variety of factors contribute to hypoglycemia in kidney dysfunction. Normally, endogenous insulin is primarily metabolized by the liver, but exogenous insulin is primarily metabolized by the kidney. So if your kidney doesn't work well, insulin levels shoot up. Decreased renal gluconeogenesis, decreased uh, appetite, malnutrition contribute to hypoglycemia as does autonomic neuropathy and a decreased counter-regulatory response. So several factors might lead to hypoglycemia in renal dysfunction. And there are factors which could also lead to hyperglycemia in renal dysfunction. A variety of chemicals act downstream to increase insulin resistance. Secondary hyperparathyroidism, vitamin D deficiency reduces insulin secretion. So there are factors causing hypoglycemia, there are factors causing hyperglycemia. Now, it's obvious that hyperglycemia will lead to further deterioration of renal function. Hypoglycemia can increase cardiovascular disease. But what is not known to some of us is that hypoglycemia, particularly severe hypoglycemia, can damage the kidneys as well. If you have severe hypoglycemia, your renal function deteriorates quicker than if you do not have severe hypoglycemia. So avoiding hyperglycemia without causing Severe hypoglycemia is the goal of treatment in using insulin in kidney disease. And overall, if you look at it theoretically, theoreticians say that there's a biphasic requirement of insulin in kidney disease. Early kidney disease, more insulin resistance, you need more insulin. As kidney disease progresses, you need less insulin. For example, if your EGFR is between 10 to 50, you reduce the dose by around 25%. EGFR less than 10, you reduce the dose by about 50%. But again, this is all theoretical because if you look at cross-sectional studies, they have shown that even in patients with moderate to advanced kidney disease, the insulin requirement is quite high. It could be because, as I said, there are factors which prevent insulin secretion. There are factors leading to insulin resistance and there's the the, the background use of other oral anti-diabetic agents is low in advanced kidney disease, resulting in a higher need for insulin. Hemodialysis complicates the scenario even further because usually with hemodialysis, as the uremic toxins are removed, insulin sensitivity goes up and on the day of hemodialysis, you need to reduce the dose of insulin by 25 to 50 percent, but there are exceptions. If the dialyzer membrane is made of polysulfone, it removes the insulin. And if you do not have endogenous insulin, you might actually need more insulin on the day of dialysis. Peritoneal dialysates have high glucose and as they osmose, they might even lead to hyperglycemia, resulting in increased insulin requirement. But again, to cut a long story short, overall, as this study shows, if you have renal dysfunction, this study included hospitalized patients with an EGFR of less than 45. So if you have moderate to severe renal dysfunction, as a whole, you need lower amounts of insulin to give the same glucose control without causing undue hypoglycemia. Now, which insulin to choose? If you look at individual insulin pharmacokinetics, aspart and Lispro have been studied and there has been no change in their pharmacokinetics. With glulysine, however, more exposure, less clearance has been reported. Detemir and Degludec, Degludec particularly has been nicely studied even in patients on hemodialysis without a change in their pharmacokinetics, whereas Glargin, as has not been studied in a PK study in patients with renal dysfunction. Now, again, we need to keep in mind that when we are using an analog insulin, the method of protraction of action is slowing its absorption, not delaying its metabolism. So it shouldn't be affected. Similarly, when we are using a rapid acting analog, it acts quickly because it's absorbed quickly, not because it's metabolized quickly, because of which there might not be big changes in their PK values. 
However, this study again turns everything on its head. Type 1 diabetes individuals, EGFR less than 60, 60 to 90, more than 90. What was seen was that as the EGFR goes to less than 60, the dose of glargin and detemir is reduced. You need lesser amounts, but the dose of NPH insulin was not reduced. Similarly, as the EGFR goes to less than 60, you needed lesser amounts of Lispro and human regular insulin, but you needed similar amounts of Aspart. So to sum it all up, the dose requirement in CKD is an area of intense personalization. You need to individualize depending on the patient. And I would not like to discuss further because of the simple reason that the dictum is to start low, gradually up titrate, depending on the individual patient and the dose requirement might be different for different insulins. But the moot issue here is that when we are using an insulin, particularly a long acting insulin in patients with renal disease, is it more prone to cause prolonged hypoglycemia, more hypoglycemia? So this study from our senior colleagues in Kolkata sort of laid this issue to rest. They said that in patients on two or three oral anti-diabetic agents with a fasting more than 150, a postprandial more than 200 or A1C more than 8%, if you add a glargin, you get good glucose control without increasing the risk of hypoglycemia. And this also gives us sort of an answer as to when to start insulin. Fasting more than 150, postprandial more than 200, A1C more than 8%, two or three oral anti-diabetic agents, you can start an insulin, improve outcomes without increasing hypoglycemia. And a similar result was seen from a study from Tehran, Iran as well. Now, if we use longer acting insulins, are the results going to be as good? So there are two real-world observational studies using a longer-acting U300 glargin, which similarly showed that there was no undue risk of increased hypoglycemia if you used longer-acting insulins. Now the question is, which insulin to use? So the studies which I showed used insulins in real-life setting, but they did not compare insulin head-on. We love comparisons. So we need to compare insulin to decide which insulin to use. So if you look at the basal insulin and if you look at RCTs with the caveat that they were all of them were not dedicated to look at these outcomes. Most of these are post hoc analysis, subgroup analysis or exploratory analysis. What we get to see is that if you compare glargin with NPH in the first study, you get better glucose lowering with glargin almost to the tune of 0.9 percentage point in A1C with lesser hypoglycemia, three times lower hypoglycemia with similar dose requirement. The addition trials showed us that the U300 glargin and the U100 glargin were similar in glucose lowering across the spectrum of renal dysfunction up to EGFR of 30, but there was significantly lower nocturnal and severe hypoglycemia with U300 glargin, but it needed a 15 to 20% greater dose than U100 glargin. I would like you to concentrate on the bright study and the conclude study because there lies the major battle between the insulins. So the bright study was in insulin naive individuals, stages 1 to 3, U300 glargin versus insulin deglutec, where a post hoc subgroup analysis found that between the EGFR of 30 to 60, U300 glargin reduced the age P1C by 0.4 percentage point more, significantly more compared to degludec. The rates of hypoglycemia were similar and the degludec dose requirement was lower than the U300 glargin. The conclude study, however, showed a different result. Here, they were not insulin naive individuals, but insulin treated individuals. The fasting targets were a bit more stringent. The duration of diabetes was longer. Here, insulin degludec improved glucose significantly better, but it was only to the tune of 0.1% HbA1c, 0.1% HbA1c. So not clinically significant, but statistically significant. In bright, it was 0.4% HbA1c. But if you look at the hypoglycemia results, overall hypoglycemia was not different, but in an exploratory analysis, nocturnal hypoglycemia reduced by about 40%. Severe hypoglycemia reduced by about 80% with degludec compared to U300 glargin. So there was a big difference there. The DEVOT trial, cardiovascular outcome trial, showed similar glucose control between U100 glargin and degludec with a lower risk of hypoglycemia as expected with degludec. So that is how 
things lie. But I would like to put a footnote that the Bright study was sponsored by Sanofi. The Conclude study was sponsored by Novo Nordisk. If you look at the real life evidence, both the Achieve and Deliver trials looked at U300 Glardzin versus U100 Glardzin and Detemid in real life settings and found similar glucose control but lower risk of hypoglycemia with U300 Glardzin. The Lightning study was a big study taking a lot of patients with moderate kidney disease. Four different insulins were compared where the rates of hypoglycemia were similar between U300 Glardzin and Degludec. But U300 Glardzin had lower hypoglycemia compared to U100 Glardzin and Detemil. A study by D. Lucas <laughs> taking patients in stage 2 and 3 kidney disease showed that IDEG was better than U100 Glardzin or Detemil. And the last study, a big Danish cohort study, about 6,000 patients showed that I insulin degludec and U300 Glardzin was similar. So if you look at all these values, possibly U300 Glardzin might give us somewhat better glucose control in insulin naive individuals between 30 to 60 eGFR. Whereas degludec, particularly in those on another insulin or longer duration of diabetes, might carry a lower risk of hypoglycemia compared with U300 Glardzin with both these ultra long acting insulins being better than U100 Glardzin or NPH insulin. What about the rapid acting analogs? Studies are very few and far between. This was one was a study with Lispro, which had two interesting findings. One, compared to regular human insulin, Lispro reduced postprandial hyperfiltration, glomerular hyperfiltration, which might translate over time into renal benefits. And of course, the postprandial glucose concentration was lower with Lispro compared to regular insulin. So that could be an effect of reduced postprandial glucose or some unknown mechanisms. The glomerular hyperfiltration was reduced. We have another study from our city which looked at a CGM based outcome comparing fast acting aspart with regular human insulin and found that glycemic variability was lower with the fast acting aspart compared to regular insulin and the risk of hypoglycemia was lower with the fast acting aspart. With glulysin, we have two studies, one in 2013 from Indonesia using capillary blood glucose monitoring, which showed no difference between glulysin and human regular insulin in patients with CKD. Whereas a CGM based study from Japan showed that compared to regular insulin, glulysin gives you better post breakfast control, better post dinner control, but similar post lunch control. There were some benefits with glulysin. So finally, coming to the conclusion. When to use insulin? Again, depending on the patient in front of you. So if anyone has severe hyperglycemia, fasting more than 250, a postprandial more than 300, A1C more than 10, you have to use insulin. Severe osmotic symptoms, you have to in use insulin. And the Kolkata study showed that a fasting more than 150, postprandial more than 200, A1C more than 8% on two or three oral anti-diabetic agents might be the optimal time to start a long-acting insulin to get better control. Which insulin to use? From the evidence that we have, if you consider the basal insulins, for somewhat better glucose control, possibly U300 insulin. For a lower risk of hypoglycemia, possibly degludec insulin. It depends on the patient in front of you. Both U300 and degludec insulin are undoubtedly better, at least in terms of hypoglycemia compared to U100 insulin, which again is undoubtedly better compared to NPH insulin, at least in terms of hypoglycemia. Talking of bolus insulin, Lispro, I would put it on top because that decreased glomerular hyperfiltration sort of excited me. That could in turn translate into renal benefits at the end of several years down the line. Fast acting aspart was better compared to regular, at least in terms of hypoglycemia and glycemic variability. Glulysin, we have two studies with mixed results. And of course, all of these are better than regular insulin, particularly with the risk, risk of glucose variability particularly with the risk of hypoglycemia. Now, if you ask what about premixed insulin, there is zero published data with premixed insulin on analogs in patients with CKD. But if you look at the British societies, they say that if a patient is on a single prandial insulin or a single basal insulin, not controlled, you can consider a premixed insulin or insulin analog in patients with DKD, but that is actually based on zero evidence. If you would like to improve out outcomes further using a continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion might be a more physiologic way because it has been shown to reduce albumin urea 
and might possibly improve renal outcomes compared to the conventional basal bolus regime. So I end with this image. Can any one of you tell me how old is this image? How many years back was it photographed? This one? Good. You were close because it was photographed yesterday afternoon using my simple mobile phone. I would just like to harp on the point that even in 2024, insulin is in DKD is still missed covered, fog covered. We don't have dedicated trials to give us an answer. Thank you.